right then. Uh, welcome to week 10. It's hard to believe we've come so far, isn't it? All right. So uh, what we're dealing with this week is we're going to talk about evaluating sources, which is going to be very valuable information to have as you're getting into the antibibliography. Uh, also, we're going to be talking over the final exam materials. Now, give me, I'll give you advance warning here. This is going to be kind of a long one today. Uh, because part of our evaluation of, source, of sources also involves trying to determine the veracity of sources and I have some resources I want to share with you to try to teach you how to uh, spot stuff that is suspect. Okay, so let's go ahead and just dive right into it. Alright, so let's talk about the reliability of sources. Once you've performed research on your topic, you need to go through your resources and evaluate them for use in your essay. Now. Sources have to be evaluated in a critical manner, looking for anything that might disqualify them or call their reliability into question. You need to be looking at your sources in a way that uh, is kind of like skepticism. You need to try to approach it in terms of, are these reliable? Can I trust it? Okay. Uh, many times evaluating a resource is more than just confirming the facts presented are correct. This process also involves evaluating how the facts are presented, the context of that presentation, and the tone the original author gives to the presentation of the facts. Uh, it is quite possible that you may find factual information that is, quite frankly, unusable because of the tone of writing that it's presented in, uh, that you have an author who has presented it in a way that uh, turns it into uh, something that is more biased than it should be. Okay. We're going to try to determine how to figure that stuff out today. Okay. All right. So let's talk about reading sources rhetorically. How do you evaluate a mountain of research and narrow it down to something more reasonable? Okay. Uh, you're going to have a lot of sources here and you're going to have a lot of information to consider. So uh, one thing that you should be doing is reading the sources with your own goals in mind. That is to say, you're focusing on the information that's going to directly help or hurt your own essay's argument. What kind of information is going to enhance your argument? What kind of stuff is going to present a positive light to the viewpoint you're trying to present? Uh, on the other hand, what kind of stuff may actually detract from it? Uh, what kind of stuff are you going to have to respond to and refute? Okay. So think of the focus of your questions. Okay. Uh, Depending on where you are in the res what point you are in the research, there's going to be a couple of different focuses you could be looking at. If you're early on uh, in your research, you've just started, you're starting to look around and find the sources that you can use. Uh, overviews are more useful to give you a handle on the subject. These would be summaries, these would be uh, abstracts, uh, something that uh, gives you an overall idea of what the article is trying to say. Okay, anything like that is going to be very useful. Further research. If you're further along down the line, uh, one thing that you should do with your sources is analyze how others are using the same information. Uh, look for practical uses and a keep, you keep your mind open to different ideas. There may be some different things that come up uh, that you may be able to use. Okay. Uh, read the sources in a rhetorical manner. Evaluate the sources based on questioning their source. You always have to be suspicious of where you're getting stuff from. Uh, in the in the Reagan era, there was a phrase that actually sums this up perfectly. Uh, it was a, one of Ronald Reagan's personal mo personal political mottos. Uh, that motto being "trust but verify." Okay. Uh, stuff is going to be accurate, but you're going to have to make sure. Uh, that you are using the most accurate stuff. So that means uh, reading the stuff rhetorically, making sure that everything is the way it should be. So uh, here's how to do a critical rhetorical reading. First off, by who is the author? Okay, who is the writer of it? What do you know about them? Look for their credentials, their affiliations, and their educational background. Now, typically, if you are using articles from like uh, trade magazines or journals, their credentials are typically located at the end of the article they've written. Uh, so most likely you will find uh, information there about where, what kind of education they have, uh, what kind of experience they've had in the field, that sort of thing. Uh, if you can't find that, one other possibility is you can go run a Google search on the author. 
Let's see if you can find anything else written by them. See if you can find any other references to them. Also, might consider looking for other works by the same author to see if they have consistency in terms of what kind of stuff they write, what topics they've written about, uh, what they uh, proclaim to be an authority on. Okay. Uh, to give you an example of uh, looking at other works to try to determine the, the credentials of an author, uh, let me harken back to a, uh, a film that I was shown in, I believe it was fifth or sixth grade, uh, when the teacher was trying to teach the class about critical thinking. And this was a cartoon that was dealing with some kids who were trying to solve a mystery involving a series of thefts at their school. Now, they weren't sure how to approach the thing, so they actually found a book titled How to Be a Detective. Uh, and they consulted that for uh, tips on what to do. Now, uh, eventually they realized that the uh, contents of the book were extremely cliche. At least one of the things that the book claimed was that uh, culprits will always return to the scene of the crime. Yeah, kind of kind of unreliable there. Uh, there were a lot of stuff that uh, did not jive with the reality, so eventually they did a little bit more critical reading and did, took a look at what the author had been doing, the other stuff that the author was credited with, and found something interesting. The author was the same author had written 35 other books that were trying to teach you how to do different other careers, and all of them had similar cliched advice in them. And none of them were even closely related to how to be a detective. Uh, a couple of them were how to be a pilot, how to be a nurse, how to be a mechanic, okay? Uh, so they quickly figured out that this uh, author is probably not reliable. And therefore, their, uh, uh, their book by him was probably not going to be actually factual, okay? Uh, next, look at the source's genre. What, figure out what the intended audience of that work is. Uh, who are they actually trying to speak to? Okay, so how do we do that? First off, look for the original publication information. Okay, the publication is actually going to tell you, uh, not explicitly, but it will give you an idea of what type of audience the uh, works are aimed for. Okay, uh, also look at the other articles that are in the issue where your uh, source appears. Okay, uh, look for work. Uh, what other kinds of uh, presentations does that uh, journal produce? What other kind of stuff are they uh, printing, publishing? What kind of other stuff is uh, the audience reading? Okay, next look at the uh, author's purpose. Okay, how is the author attempting to shape the audience's views? Okay, so what exactly is the meaning for the work? What kind of purpose did the author have? Uh, first off, think about what type of writing it is. Is the piece expressive, informational, analytical, or persuasive? You might be wondering what the difference is. Here's what the difference is between these. Uh, expressive works tend to be more creative in nature. These things include uh, creative nonfiction, literary fiction, uh, fiction in general, uh, poetry, uh, pretty much anything that requires artistry in the writing is going to be considered expressive. Okay. Informational is going to be just strictly like that. It's going to be like reports, okay? Uh, very factual, very much uh, even in terms of uh, balance, even in terms of bias. Analytical uh, writing is going to be stuff that breaks down a complex topic into smaller bits so that it's e easier for the reader to consume and understand. And then finally is persuasive, which we've been working with, so you kind of know what that is. Persuasive, you're trying to convince the audience that you're right and they should uh, do what you say. All right, then look who at who sponsored the site it came from. Okay, where did the where did the author's uh, work come from? Who who are they tailoring the work for? Uh, who paid for the work to be written? Okay. That could be important because if it's something like a company that may have a mixed reputation and they're paying somebody to uh, inflate their reputation, make them seem a lot better than they actually are, uh, that may be problematic. That may lead to a problematic source. Uh, another one, what is the publication's reputation? OK, 
okay what kind of other stuff has the uh, publication done in the past uh, what kind of stuff have they published what kind of stuff what kind of writing do they generally uh, trade in okay now this leads me to kind of a funny story where this can sometimes to try to show that this can sometimes be counterintuitive okay so you have to be kind of you can worry about this but sometimes uh, it's not really important okay so let me give you an example of that uh, when I was a senior in high school uh, my English class I took was a college composition course now uh, because it was high school there was still a literature requirement for the class uh, we wound up writing reading two novels in the class but the first one was the only one that was explicitly picked by the teacher uh, and that book that he had us read was 1984 by George Orwell uh, I'm sure uh, most of you are probably familiar, if not with the book itself, then with the basic concepts of it. It's basically a uh, treatise on, uh, it's one of the, one of the original dystopian uh, novels of the 20th century. Uh, I would count it along with Brave New World, okay? Uh, 1984 is also kind of a horrific story because it's basically what happens when uh, human decency dies, okay? Uh, so 1984 uh, was the only novel that the teacher explicitly assigned. Uh, but as part of the materials that he had collected to surround that novel, there were, after we finished reading it, then we were given a handout of an article written by a futurist titled 1994. Now this was an article that was written in 1984 by this futurist, uh, who was analyzing 1984, the book, and trying to determine what Orwell had gotten right, what had gotten wrong, and trying to forecast what was going to come in the next 10 years. Uh, how 1994 would look in, as opposed to, compared to what uh, Orwell had uh, predicted for 1984. Okay, all well and good. It sounds like an interesting article, right? Okay, here's the thing. Uh, he gave us photocopies of the article, okay? So we were reading it and analyzing it, okay? Uh, but you actually, but they were directly taken from the original publication that the uh, article was taken from. You might see where I'm going with this, okay? Publication reputation, right? As it happens, this article was uh, originally published in Playboy, okay? Now, you might be wondering to yourself, why would a futurist write an write a intellectual article for what amounts to a soft, softcore porn magazine? And the answer to that might actually surprise you. It used to be that uh, Playboy had a reputation as a springboard for literary writing. Okay, uh, You actually had very serious writers and novelists who were contributing uh, work to Playboy. Okay, uh, some things that might surprise you. There's three authors in particular that might surprise you got their start writing for Playboy. Okay, one of them is J.D. Salinger. Uh, the if you're familiar with Catcher in the Rye, just about everybody gets assigned it and uh, tends to hate it. Okay, uh, but Catcher in the Rye uh, involves characters, uh, specifically the character Holden Caulfield that uh, Salinger had written short stories about and published in Playboy. Okay. Another author, one that will really surprise you, who got, their, got his start writing for Playboy, was Shel Silverstein, okay, the poet, all right? He, he used to write body poetry for Playboy before he started getting into children's poetry, okay? Another author that, got, that had significant stuff published in Playboy was Ray Bradbury. Uh, he's a claimed science fiction author. Probably his best-known work is Fahrenheit 451, okay? Uh, these are all serious... Uh, authors in the literary world who for some reason were actually able to get stuff published in Playboy and still get taken seriously. Okay? So, as I said, the publication's reputation can sometimes uh, determine whether something is reliable, but on the other hand, sometimes it could just be, okay, it just happens to be in porn. Okay? Uh, so just keep, in, keep that in mind. Alright? You still want to think about the publication's reputation but maybe you need to think a little further about the publication if it's not one that you're expecting. Okay? Uh, next one, what's the author's angle or bias? What data and information does the author cite? 
Uh, here's the important part. Are they using all the available information and all the pertinent information? Okay, or are they just using stuff that makes them look better? Uh, what are the author's underlying values, assumptions, and beliefs? Okay, what do they really believe in? What are they trying to express in their writing? What kind of things do they uh, want you to get across? Okay, uh, and here's another good one. What is not included? Uh, are they leaving anything out that may actually uh, hurt their argument a lot more than the stuff that they leave in helps it? Okay. All right, so the next thing here is taking purposeful notes. So think about this. How do you typically take notes in a class? Okay. Uh, most people will answer that question by saying that they're going to take notes by uh, just writing down by rote uh, what the lecturer tells them. Okay. Uh, if they're taking notes on research, they're usually just writing down what's in the, in the uh, research source. Uh, if you're... Uh, 16 year old me taking US history you're actually drawing out pictograms of what's happening in the lectures uh, because it's e because it's easier for you to uh, handle t note taking if it's a visual format okay there's a, a, several types of approaches to taking notes many students will do doing initial research for works for their own essays many of them will simply photocopy their sources which is an extremely bad idea okay uh, photocopying leads to regurgitation rather than original ideas. Okay, so we do not want you photographing, uh, photocopying things, okay? It's just going to lead you to, uh, I have to spit out these facts. Uh, however I can get them out there, I'm going to get them out there. All right, so uh, the question then becomes, how should notes be taken? Okay, a uh, few options. There's one really good technique that Yagelsky gives you in the textbook and that is taking three columns in your notebook okay and taking your notes in those three columns okay here's how he sets it up okay uh, column A is your bibliographical information okay that's going to be the article name the author name publication date publisher uh, all the stuff that you need uh, to create a works cited listing for that source Okay, that goes in the bibliographical information. Center column, that's the informational notes on the source. So this would be where it came from, what other material was presented in the same issue, and quotations from the source. Okay, so the middle column is the factual information that you need from that article. Then you get to the uh, right-hand column, that's the exploratory notes. Okay, and these are going to be self-evaluation of the value of the source. Uh, this includes things like questions the source raises and ideas about how the source's information fits in with your thesis. Okay, This would be the point where you would evaluate whether uh, that source is going to be actually use for, useful for you or if it's something you should just leave, leave to the side. Now, there's several functions that you can use sources for. So there's not, they're not limited to the types of things you can do, use, your, use your research for, okay? Uh, but this, the four primary functions uh, really cover what most people will use research sources for in essays, okay? So they'll use it for background information first. It presents perspective for the subject in a greater context, okay? Uh, then you're looking at uh, what is the uh, information that the reader needs to know before you actually get into your argument, okay? Uh, you have you can use uh, sources as an alternative view, either as a counter to your thesis, in which in which case you want to summarize that source and then respond to it by refuting their argument, or if it agrees with your thesis, you might just want to mention it briefly, okay? Just give give out give out something that that particular source says that agrees with you, okay? Uh, it can be used for information or testimony, okay? Uh, it can be used as evidence for your own thesis, especially if it's testimony, okay? Uh, something that's going to help your argument, something that's going to make you seem more correct. Uh, it may also be countered to your position or raise doubts about your thesis, in which case this is something that you would bring up uh, when you are addressing the opposition and attempting to refute the opposition. This would actually be one of those things where you would have to 
uh, cop to the fact that, okay, this information exists out there. It supports my opponent, but here's how I'm going to counter that. The other use for, for research is, is theory or method to influence the approach. So are you going to use that source to kind of inform your writing? Are you going, is, that going, is it going to help you illustrate what the point is or what the actual uh, research you're doing is? is you're going to use that as a lens kind of okay uh i have done all of these okay in past writing and the the most interesting one was the theory or method okay uh this happened with my master's thesis uh i'm not sure if i've mentioned it before with this class was when i did my master's thesis it was uh close to 100 pages on mythic mythic storytelling patterns in modern pop culture media okay but there had to be some kind of guiding philosophy that I was using to analyze this stuff. So I found five sources in particular, uh, five of them that uh, were usable because they all defined mythology, but they defined it in three different ways. So I could use all three as a guideline, okay? The first style of mythology I could find was uh, the standard hero's journey model myth, okay? Uh, so I had a couple of sources on that. One of them was the master of that was Joseph Campbell, uh, his uh, book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Okay, I used that as a uh, the basis for the originally just the idea of it. Okay, in addition to that, there's another alter, altered version of it called The Writer's Journey. Uh, that's actually the actual name of the book. Uh, it was written by a Hollywood screenwriter uh, initially as a memo to the Disney Company for uh, uh, prescriptions on how to do script doctoring, uh, but it basically adapts the writer's journey into the three act movie style, the three act movie format. Okay. Uh, then in the middle of it, we have a different version of the monomyth that's commonly called the American monomyth. Uh, and that one is kind of interesting because it finds a lot of its origins in comic books. Uh, the, the format of the American monomyth winds up being that you have a uh, paradise that's been violated by something or someone, and then an outsider hero comes in to uh, rescue the Eden and eliminate the threat. And once the threat is oh, once the threat is gone, then the hero has two options: he can either walk, uh, ride off into the sunset to go to the next violated Eden, or he can. Uh, uh, end his venturing days and uh, absorb himself into the community. Okay? So there is actually a book out there called The American Monomyth, which profiles this a lot. Uh, again, it uh, finds a lot of its origins in not only standard superhero fare, it also finds some of its origins in uh, alt comics of the 60s and 70s. Uh, I will say one of the uh, influences that these authors had was the uh, cartoonist Robert Crumb. Okay? It's an interesting book if you want to check it out. The third format of mythology that I had to look at was an uh, actual field of study called semiotics, uh, which is a, a field of study where you're learning about how symbols are created in societies. Okay, uh, Semiotics is actually an interesting uh, field, especially when you're dealing with pop culture, because symbols are created all over the place. Okay. Uh, and it's not just like logos or anything like that. This is like uh, symbols in uh, storytelling, uh, symbols in culture, things like that. There's two really good sources that I used for this. One of them is a book titled Mythologies by Roland Barthes, who's a French philosopher, uh, kind of the father of semiotics. Okay, uh, Mythologies is a series of essays where he's talking about stuff that he's observing in French culture and how it's become symbolic, okay? How we create symbols. And you can tell it's 20th century. This is published, I believe, in the 50s. Uh, the uh, essays were produced, like, from the late 40s to, I think, 1951 was the most recent of those essays. Uh, some of the stuff that uh, Barthes talks about uh, includes things like movies, includes things like professional wrestling, Okay, includes things like uh, radio, okay, music, things like that. Uh, matter of fact, one very interesting thing that I learned from mythologies is 
the impression that we have in the modern era of what the Roman Empire was like pretty much entirely stems from the movie adaptation of, Mac of uh, Julius Caesar, uh, which starred uh, Marlon Brando as Brutus. Okay. Uh, everything we think we know about the Roman Empire, everything that we think of when we think of the Roman Empire uh, in the common consciousness, a lot of that stems from this production. Uh, especially in what one thing Barthes points out is uh, especially hairstyles, okay? Uh, hairstyles and pers perspiration. Because every Roman has as some, some form of a full head of hair. There's no bald Romans. Okay. And the intellectual Romans in the movie are all profusely sweating. The only one that isn't sweating is Caesar himself, because he's considered to be above the rest of everybody else. And therefore, actually, Bartha says he does not sweat because he does not think. OK, which is kind of kind of an interesting take on it. So uh, Barthas was one source. The other one that I used uh, for semiotics is an American named Marshall Blonsky, who put out a book called uh, American Mythologies, which was his take on it, but using American pop culture, uh, primarily from the 70s and 80s. OK, uh, a little bit from the 50s, because I remember the book has a giant photo of a giant pop art picture of Marilyn Monroe on it. Uh, but he took much the same approach, and he's using distinctively American uh, pop culture to explore this. Now, while uh, Barthas was using stuff like films and pro wrestling and radio uh, to give you a for instance, uh, Blonsky seems a little bit more lowbrow because two of the things that he analyzes in American mythologies uh, turns out to be advertising and pornography. Okay. But he uses them to show how we create symbols. Okay, that's all it's all about. So those five works that I used for research all wound up influencing how I approached the rest of the essay. Uh, they formed basically the framework for how I approached the research and what I did to write it. All right, so let's talk about evaluating the, the sources through each category here, starting with reliability. How accurate is the source against other sources reporting the same or similar facts? Okay. Uh, what kind of information is being presented to you and how are the other, uh, how are the other authors using those same resources using them? Okay. Are they presenting them in a, a fashion that's pretty similar across the board or is there some kind of variance? Uh, are facts distorted to serve the author's own agenda? Okay, are they actually twisting things around so that they're, they seem more right? Okay. Now, is, if they are, is the manipulation of facts acknowledged by the author? Are they willing to admit that, yeah, you know what, there's going to be, uh, this is going to be open to interpretation? Okay. If they acknowledge how it can be manipulated or massaged, uh, that's going to lead to a little bit slightly, slightly higher reliability because they're at least going to be honest about it. Uh, another thing to th think about is if their facts have been checked by an independent source. Okay. Fact checking is hugely valuable, especially in today's day and age. Okay. So if you can have a resource fact checked, uh, all the better. Okay. Another one to think about how well edited is the source. Okay. But this, tends to apply more to web-based sources and print sources, but even still, how well edited is the source? Uh, what kind of craftsmanship is there in the writing? How, what kind of attention is there in the editing? That gets us to credibility, okay? Now, reliability is based on external factors uh, where you're going to be uh, judging things from an external point of view. Uh, you're look at, looking at things as an outsider. Uh, credibility comes entirely from the inside. It comes from the author themselves. Okay. So determining credibility is going to be based on what the author has done. So this amounts to how much do you trust the author? Are they an expert in the field? Okay. Do they know what they're talking about? If they're not an expert, are they a trustworthy observer? Is it somebody who has a good 
perspective, somebody who's close enough to the subject to understand it. Okay. Uh, sometimes uh, credibility can come down to trivial things. For instance, like do you like the way the author dresses? Okay. Uh, this this actually this specific one actually would come up a lot with uh, uh, in person presentations if you're quoting speeches and stuff like that. Uh, if you're if you've got somebody who doesn't know how to dress for an occasion, uh, that may be less reliable. Or to put it another way, uh, don't wear your clown suit to the funeral. Okay. Uh, also, is it a popular author or a not so popular author? Is it somebody who is going to gain credibility simply by the size of their audience? Okay. The main way, though, that writers earn their credibility is through moral courage, integrity, and consistency of principle. Okay. This is what a lot of writers want to be. They want to be trusted. They want to be credible. And the way they do it is through their past actions. I will, the example I love to use for, the, for this particular concept uh, is two particular journalists, okay? Uh, you probably know them best just by their last names. If I say Woodward and Bernstein, okay? Uh, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein. Uh, they were two reporters for the Washington Post. Uh, they have actually pretty much achieved historic immortality because they were the reporters that broke the story that eventually became Watergate and eventually led to the resignation of Richard Nixon as president. Okay. Uh, Woodward and Bernstein did a lot of work, a lot of legwork, a lot of very dangerous legwork because uh, people were gunning for them uh, because, they were, because they were going after the president. Okay. Uh, they, them and they also had a... a they also had a uh, informant inside the White House that they were they, they tended to quote in their articles on Watergate. Uh, the source remained anonymous, so they gave they for ease of reference they gave him the name Deep Throat. Okay, uh, but they used their sources and they pulled together this article, these the series of articles about the Watergate break in, which eventually wound up implicating the president and much of his inner circle. All right, so uh, they earned their credibility, okay? And they're still using that credibility. In fact, Woodward was just recently in the news, okay? You can look it up. I'm not going to tell you specifically about it, but you can, you can find out what he's done in the news lately, okay? He's still out there doing journalistic work. All right, let's talk about angle of vision. How does the author's underlying values, assumptions, or beliefs shape the argument as it is presented. What kind of things are they telling you that's going to affect the way they see the topic, okay? So how do we figure this out? One thing you can do is research the author, okay? Find out everything you can about what that author believes in and does, okay? So what's that author's politics like, okay? What kind of, what kind of causes do they support? What kind of education does the audience, does, does the audi uh, audience, what kind of education does the author have? Okay, uh, did they go to school? Did they go to grad school? Did they graduate? Okay, what kind of upbringing? What was their childhood like? Okay, what kind of reputation do they have? What have they done to build that reputation? Okay, uh, then also you want to research the genre. What kind of stuff that they're writing? Okay. First off, evaluate the audience that they're writing for. Who is specifically is the target audience for your source? What kind of, what kind of people are they trying to write for? Uh, look at the market niche. What corner of the market does the publication exist for? Okay. Uh, who are they really trying to reach? Okay. Then look at the political reputation of the publication. What have they done in the past? How have they approached similar topics? Uh, one thing that helps with this is no knowledge of the political spectrum, okay? A base knowledge of the political spectrum and how authors, publishers, and websites fall on the chart is useful in the evaluation of sources, okay? It is really helpful for you to know uh, where your sources lie on that spectrum. Now, obvious bias toward one end of the spectrum or the other can lead to coloring of facts to suit their politics. It may render those facts unusable for the sake of a persuasive essay. The use of it in a politicized manner, uh, the use of those facts may wind up polluting those facts to the point where you cannot use them in an impartial way. Okay? Now, 
Uh, the next slide contains some examples of author, uh, publications and blogs and where they all lie on the political spectrum. Okay, uh, I'm going to show you this chart and then I'm going to show you a newer version of it. Okay, uh, this chart was produced by a uh, public policy professor named Vanessa Otero, uh, and it's, it's a chart which has the political spectrum on it. And it also has a, a y-axis. There's an x-axis for the political spectrum. There's a y-axis uh, for reliability. So here is the base chart. Okay. So here's what here's what you're looking at for this base chart. Uh, you have an x-axis where you have the uh, political spectrum. Okay. Uh, up the up and down the middle there. That's going to be more centrist. Uh, toward the right, that's going to be conservative. Toward the left, that's going to be liberal. Okay? So, uh, then going vertically here, you have trustworthiness. Okay? Uh, at the very top here, you have what is most trustworthy. Uh, really, it's going to be as close to 100% factual as possible. And then you go and down, it becomes less and less reliable until you get to the bottom, uh, where they actually use the phrase contains inaccurate slash fabricated info. Okay. So, uh, this is a really good source, but it's been updated. Okay. As you can see, this, this particular version is from 2017. There's a lot of outlets on here that are missing. Okay. Uh, and some of them have actually shifted around a little bit. Okay, so uh, just to be on the safe side here, we're going to show you the updated version of this chart. All right, here we go. This is uh, uh, this is the most recent version of this media bias chart. Okay, it's uh, version 6.0. Okay, uh, here's what we have here. Again, same same axes apply. The x-axis is the political spectrum. The y-axis is trustworthiness. Okay, ranging from up top to the north, original fact reporting, then fact reporting, complex analysis or mix of fact reporting analysis, analysis or high variation reliability, opinion or high variation reliability, selective or incomplete story, unfair presentation, persuasion rather, propaganda contains misleading info, contains inaccurate slash fabricated info. Okay. Now, there's also a... Uh, uh, boxes here, green, yellow, orange, red. Uh, green are the most reliable sources. Yellow have mixed reliability. Orange is somewhat unreliable. Uh, and red is going to be absolutely unreliable. Okay. Uh, so, if you take a look at some of the outlets that are on here. Okay. Uh, as you can see in that green box, it's mostly news organizations. Uh, which you would expect, but this is mainly high-profile news organizations and wire services. Okay, uh, you can see Associated Press, Reuters. Uh, she see here. Uh, then we have a lot of uh, base. Uh, we have a, a lot of uh, news networks here. Uh, NBC News, CBS News, ABC News, PBS News. Uh, Bloomberg News Network. Uh, we have some newspapers here: Denver Post, Houston Chronicle, uh, uh, New York Times, Washington Post. Okay. We have some news magazines here. We've got Newsweek. We have uh, let's see. You have NPR, uh, Newsy, uh, USA Today is there. <clears throat> uh, they stuck the Weather Channel in here, although it kind of goes without saying that the Weather Channel is usually reliable. Um, and then we have some of the more opinionated stuff near the bottom there, uh, spreading out a little bit from along the, ax the uh, uh, x-axis. Uh, but you still have some interesting stuff here. CNN is down there. Uh, HuffPost is now put, placed into the green box. Uh, used to be strictly in the yellow. Okay. Uh, then you have Wall Street Journal, The Hill, uh, Christianity Today, uh, IJR. Uh, one I find that's very interesting that is in this green box is The Root. Uh, the Root is a uh, site that focuses primarily on African American news. Uh, and it's considered to be very, apparently considered to be very reliable. 
Okay, so that does it for the green box. Now you may notice that some of these are actually combined within the green and the yellow boxes. Okay, uh, let's take a look at some of the ones that are in the yellow box. Okay, uh, that we have uh, CNN's TV uh, network. Uh, we have Salon, Slate, The Daily Beast. Okay, uh, the New York Post, Daily Mail, uh, Real Clear Politics, uh, the Washington Times, Epic Times. Uh, Newsmax, then we have The Blaze. This is way higher than The Blaze used to be. The Blaze used to be down down at the bottom. They've increased, they've apparently improved their rep. Uh, we have OAN, which is One American News. I'm not sure why it's up that far north. Uh, we have Fox News in the yellow, uh, National Review. Uh, and then some of these are, start, are bordering between yellow and orange which will get to mixed reliability and somewhat unreliable. Uh, so that gets us to Town Hall, uh, Western Journal, uh, Breitbart, The Federalist. Uh, on, the right, on the left, you have MS, MSNBC, Jacobin, D Democracy Now!, Common Dreams, uh, Counterpunch, okay, FSTV. Okay, then you're moving down to the orange, okay, and out to the fringes of the orange. We have Judicial Watch is out in the fringe of the orange. Uh, they're somewhat unreliable. Uh, CNS News, Life News. Uh, then we have the Daily Wire, Daily Caller. Uh, Fox News' is TV network is in the orange. Uh, PJ Media, American Thinker, Twitchy, uh, WND. And then you go to the left uh, wing. Uh, Crooks and Liars, The Daily Cost, Occupied Democrats, Alternet, uh, Bipartisan Report, and Palmer Report. Okay? Strictly in the orange. Now we're getting down into the red. Okay? You may notice on the left wing there's really only one that borders even close to the red, uh, and that's Wonkat. It actually crosses a little bit down into the red. Uh, the other ones, the other sources that are in the red uh, are either center right or fully right wing, okay? Uh, at center right, you have National Enquirer and World Truth TV. Uh, and then to the far right, you have News Punch, GP, and uh, the bottom of the barrel, Infowars. All right, another thing to consider about your uh, sources is their degree of advocacy. How uh, much of a stake are they putting into what it is that they are discussing, okay? How obviously does the author take a stance in the source? So, this comes down to a matter of whether you need objective or persuasive sources, okay? So, is it an objective or persuasive source? One thing to ask is, does the author have skin in the game, okay? Do they have a personal stake in the outcome of the argument? Is it going to benefit them or uh, detract from them one way or the other? Or is the author a mere observer? Are they just looking from the outside in and seeing what's going on? Okay. Does the author have a membership in an advocacy organizations such as a super PAC or a think tank or some other kind of affinity group? Uh, for example, uh, uh, the NRA, the Sierra Club, okay? Uh, what, what kind of memberships do they have? Is that going to influence how they look at the subject matter? And the one thing that might be a really simple one, does the author hold, just hold a grudge? Okay. Do they just hold some kind of uh, personal vendetta against whoever they're writing about? Okay. Weigh the evidence carefully. Make sure that they're actually using that evidence fairly. Okay. Because if they are holding a grudge, then the interpretation of the data can be called into question. Okay? One thing to keep in mind here, neutrality, as much as possible, is going to usually provide better resources in terms of research. Okay? That means they're going to be more factual and they're going to be a little bit more even-handed in terms of being fair to both sides. Now, social media also tends to be a minefield of opinion, so be cautious about using from sources from sites such as Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, so on and so forth, okay? A lot of these things allow you to uh, share links to news sites, okay? Uh, some of them are news sites, some of them are news sites, some of them are, oh God, who's calling this news sites, okay? 
Uh, trolling efforts tend to center on social media. Also, that's another thing to keep in mind. It's vital to be able to detect fake accounts that may not be trustworthy. Okay. Uh, to help you with this, Clemson University is use, has created a site called spotthetroll.org. And what that does is it trains people to spot professional trolling. Okay? So, uh, what I thought we could do is have a little fun here. This is going to be your questions to the professor exercise for this week. Uh, we're going to have you guys take the quiz along with me. Okay? And we're going to play Spot the Troll and see if we can figure out what's a troll and what isn't. All right, so here we are at the Spot the Troll website, okay? Uh, this is run by Clemson University's Media Forensics Hub, okay? So Spot the Troll is the quiz where you examine images of real social media content and decide whether it's from a legitimate account or from an internet troll. Now, here's, here's the wel welcome page. Welcome, real human. A troll is a fake social media account often created to spread misleading information. Each of the following eight profiles include a brief selection of posts from a single social media account. You, you decide if each is an authentic account or a professional troll. After each profile, you'll review the signs that can help you determine if it's a troll or not. Okay? So here's how we're going to handle this exercise. All right? You guys are going to uh, play along with me. We're going to evaluate the uh, social media profiles. Uh, on your, I want you to guys to keep a single open response to my questions to the professor uh, thread uh, and uh, play along with me. When, you're, when we reach the end of the listing, I'm going to give you a gap worth of time in order to determine whether it's legit or not. Okay? In that time, I want you to write in your response, uh, is it a troll or is it a real person? and what makes you think that they are uh, they are what you think they are okay here's the one rule though no cheating here if you get one wrong you cannot go back and change your answer okay this is not, this is only going to work if you give me the first is the first impression you get in the first response okay so here we go with profile number one profile number one I scroll through this twitter profile then select the answer at the bottom okay so this is a Twitter profile for a young woman named Chloe Evans. Uh, this is a student in Atlanta, joined June of 2014, uh, has 196 following that accounts that she follows and 54 people following her. Okay. So we have a uh, avatar picture. We have a cover page picture. Okay. So let's take a look at some of Chloe's tweets. Okay. Uh, first tweet, this is all going to hell, hashtag dead horse. Well, that's pleasant. All right, next tweet. But who's responsible? Obama? Hashtag dead horse, hashtag chemical accident Louisiana. And we have a screenshot of, a, of CNN's uh, homepage. Uh, looks like they are... Uh, Looks like they're trying to focus on this main story right here. Plant explosion in Centerville caused panic. Plant explosion at Columbian Chemicals Company, Centerville, Louisiana, caused a wave of panic among the residents of the nearby towns, of the nearest towns. All right. Next. Bravery is the capacity to behave properly even when scared half to death. Omar N. Bradley. Hashtag quote, hashtag true. Uh, next one. Hashtag something you didn't know about me. I used to be a model. Next tweet. Don't ask what meaning of life is. You define it. Hashtag quote. Hashtag true. Uh, last tweet here. Maturity is a bitter disappointment for which no remedy exists unless laughter could be said to remedy anything. Hashtag Kurt Vonnegut. All right. So uh, let's have let's turn it over to you guys. Uh, I want you guys to try to figure out if Chloe here is a professional troll or if they are legit, if she's a legit website. Okay. We'll give you a gap time here. Uh, put it, put your answers into your reply.
All right, think you got it figured out? Is this troll or is it legit? Let's see. Let's see how you came up. This profile is a troll. Okay. Chloe was a Russian-made troll account. Hundreds of Twitter accounts like Chloe were active throughout 2014 and 2015. These trolls were an early, highly automated effort by the Internet Research Agency, or IRA, based in St. Petersburg, Russia. Unfortunately, the agency has gotten much, much better at its job. Okay? So, what are some signs that Chloe was a troll? Okay, you might be asking yourself. Maybe, if, maybe especially if you got it wrong. Okay? Some of the signs. Number one, hoax events. Early IRA accounts like Chloe pushed hoax events that never happened, like the CNN post below, which was a fake story photoshopped to look real. Okay? And might I add, photoshopped kind of badly. If you take a look at it compared to the rest of the, uh, look at the uh, story itself compared to the rest of the page here, the rest of it's legit. Uh, so actually you can kind of tell what, what article this replaced. Uh, this, the article that this replaced was an article about uh, uh, Oscar Pistorius' murder trial. Okay? Because uh, the three stories directly below it are about uh, Oscar Pistorius. Okay? Uh, the Obama one is legit. Okay? Uh, we will degrade, ultimately destroy ISIS. Difficult speech for Barack Obama. President announces U.S. airstrikes will hit targets in war ravaged Syria as well as Iraq. Okay? Here's another couple of tells that this is a fake article that's been photoshopped in here. Number one, they couldn't even bother, they couldn't even be bothered to uh, match the shade of white. Okay. Number two, the writing of the caption uh, is terrible. Okay. Uh, it does not follow any journalistic standards, uh, and the photo does not have a photo credit. Okay. So this is a this is a, a uh, manipulated uh, media example, okay? Sign number two: profile images of attractive women. Okay, I know all the guys out there are, say, are thinking, "Hey," but no, no, this is actually a real thing. These fake accounts typically use profile images of women in their twenties. This is a common tactic of the internet charlatan still today. Uh, let that be a lesson to you guys. Uh, if you think you're communicating with a beautiful woman, most likely you're most likely you're being catfished by an overweight Russian man. Okay. Let's go on to profile number two. Okay, this is another Twitter profile. Select an answer at the bottom. Okay. So this is the profile of one Harmony Anderson. Okay, she has another uh, avatar picture. She has a uh, cover cover photo. Uh, here's the description of the account. This college girl who managed to say conservative. Hashtag pro-life, hashtag pro-2A, hashtag America first. This is my second account where I share my political and social views. From, Ar from Ankeny, Iowa, joined September 2019, uh, following 3,162 accounts and has 4,216 followers. Okay? Uh, seems all good, nice and all-American. Let's take a look at her tweets. First tweet, Pennsylvania voter rolls near Pittsburgh are full of inaccuracies. 1,583 dead people registered to vote, 7,500 flagged as duplicate voters, nearly 50 born in the 1800s, 2020 runs through Pennsylvania, retweet for national voter ID now, U.S. U.S. Trump 2020. Okay. Uh, this contains a uh, uh, video link to a uh, site called Cup of Joe. Uh, captioned leaked DNC group teaches illegals to vote okay next one 22 million or even more illegals now in America and the Dems want them all to have full citizenship and voting rights the demo rat party has been getting illegal votes for years because that's the only way Bloomberg or any Dem candidate can win uh, from Emmy okay uh, we have a video of uh, what looks like uh, uh, I would, I think it's uh, Tucker Carlson after a night long bender, okay, uh, who's talking, who's basically talking head about all this uh, uh, topic here, okay. Uh, next one is a retweet from uh, the first lady. Thank you, Sarvadaya School, for welcoming me with the lovely Tilak and RT tradition, okay. Next post is a reblog from retweet from James Woods, okay. 
Uh, yeah, why would Vogue ever want to put this stunning, timeless, classic beauty on their cover when they can have a linebacker and drag? What hypocrites they are. Hashtag Flotus is astounding. <sighs> dog whistle? No, more like dog bullhorn. Okay. Next one. It's possible he's under the impression he's been running for Senate this whole time. Uh, and she's sharing a video from ABC News. Uh, supposedly it's jo it's Joe Biden. My name is Joe Biden. I'm a Democratic candidate for United States Senate. If you don't like me, you can vote for the other Biden. Okay. Uh, next one. I'd heard this before, but it fascinates me that it was almost 30 years ago. He's been talking about it for years, and it's only intensified. But Donald Trump is a true patriot. I'm so proud to call this man our leader. Uh, this is a video of a never aired Donald Trump interview from 1980 from real in real in the years or real in in the years dot com. That's what that hit. I've, I've tried this once before and I could not read that uh, bar mark. I'm just now able to read it. OK, uh, share if you love POTUS. OK. So we'll give you guys a chance here. Uh, take take a take a minute. Think over what you've seen here. Uh, is this account a troll or is it legit? You think you got it figured out? Let's see what you do. All right. So Harmony Anderson is a troll. Harmony is a troll. We attributed to the Russian Internet Research Agency in March 2020. We then worked with Twitter to have her account suspended. Like many other trolls, Harmony poses as a young woman who has very strong political opinions and sets herself up in direct opposition to an extreme version of people on the other side of the political divide. Harmony's goal is to make us more entrenched and disgusted with one another and make meaningful compromise more difficult. Okay? So, how can we tell that Harmony is a troll? Let's look at the signs. One, lack of personal info. It's important to notice what isn't in Harmony's profile. Anything other than politics. There's no identifying info about family, school, or work, friends, pets, houseplants, nothing. Okay? We have a manufactured profile here for somebody who does absolutely nothing but think about politics. That's kind of suspect. Uh, connecting to the community. Troll accounts like Harmony often retweet prominent voices. These may include positive and uplifting content to gain credibility and connect with their target audiences. Okay. As you may notice the only really positive uh, tweet that uh, Harmony re that Harmony posted was a retweet of the First Lady being greeted by children. And even the other retweet she had that was supposed to be uplifting was, again, uh, racist bullhorn. 
uh, from James Woods. Okay. So let's look at profile number three. Uh, no, profile number three, this is a Facebook profile. Okay. Go look through the profile and then we're going to select an answer at the bottom. Here we go. So this profile is for a gentleman named Christopher Warwick. Okay. Lives in Columbia City, Indiana. He's from Columbia City, Indiana. He has 94 friends. We have a very nice profile picture here. We have the same photo as his cover page. Uh, very nice looking family. He has a wife and looks like two daughters. Okay. All right, so let's take a look at Christopher's posts. Okay. So first one, share this violent or graphic photo everywhere and tell Zuckerberg to suck it. Okay. So this is obviously about kneeling for the uh, kneeling for the anthem and the flag. This is why you don't step on the flag. This is why you stand for the national anthem. This is why we don't erase history. So this is also also about the Confederate uh, monuments. You're not black, white, yellow, or brown. You're American. Start acting like it. Okay. Next post. This photo of Chick-fil-A honoring fallen soldiers on Memorial Day is triggering liberals across social media. Let's make it go viral. Share a million times. Okay. Yeah, it looks like it's in a Chick-fil-A. I will say this is a tradition that's also done by the uh, Veterans of Foreign Wars, where they set, a t where they set up a table for, a, uh, for any POW who wants to come in. Uh, it's more symbolic than anything. Okay. Next post, this is how you have fun in the tractor. Okay. And they have some selfie action going on here. Uh, next one, we have a neat, neat little piece of artwork here from uh, uh, reposted from Greek Gateway. Pray for the world. May God bless everyone. Hashtag coronavirus. Okay. Next one, don't forget about this place for lunch. We have a, uh, looks like a, a local diner called the Columbia Locker Incorporated. Uh, fresh meats in Delhi and a, bit, a board showing all their lunch specials. Okay. Uh, hot and ready to eat. Oh, that's good to know. All right. Let's see. Uh, next one, makes you want to reread the passage again. Okay. So this is a meme. Uh, a Renaissance portrayal of God, and let's see what the uh, t caption says. I didn't say the end would be signaled by trumpets. I said Trump Pence. Ha ha ha. Okay. Next one. Oh no, it's next door. Quick, everyone panic. Oh wait, everyone already is thanks to the media. Uh, it's a uh, uh, posting of a, uh, looks like a story from a news site. First COVID-19 case confirmed in Northeast Indiana. All right, so uh, evaluate this one. Uh, just giving your impression, do you think this is a troll account or do you think this is a legitimate account? Okay, go ahead and uh, think it over and write down your response.
work. Do you think you know? All right, let's see what you do. This account is legitimate. This is an actual uh, person. Chris is a real person. Chris is a kind husband and father living in Columbia City, Indiana. We can confirm he is real because we know him personally. Okay? So let's see. What are the signs that he's a legit site? Or that he's a legit profile? Uh, he posts about life. Chris shares personal content about his family and his community, such as the local lunch spot recommendation below. Okay? So that means that the selfie there was a real selfie taken in the real mirror, rearview mirror of his real tractor driving behind him a real tiller while he's holding his real daughter in his lap in the driver's seat. All right. Next one, multidimensional views. This is a big one, okay? Uh, Chris does not push out constant messages supporting extreme views. For example, while some of his political posts are right-leaning, he also posts fun of President Trump. Okay, This is kind of important because I actually have accounts that I follow. In fact, one of my aunts is an account exactly like this where you cannot tell what her pol politics are because they will change with the shifting of the wind. Okay, so, And I know for sure she's a real person because I actually lived with her for a couple of years. <laughs> so, uh, and she has those kinds of complex viewpoints. Okay, so uh, this was a real site. Let's look, a real account rather. Let's look at profile number four. All right, the next one is an Instagram profile. Okay, let's again, again, we'll take a look at it and then we'll figure out what it is. Okay, uh, this Instagram account is called Power to Women. Okay, here's a description American feminist. She needed a hero, so that's what she became. 892 posts, 9,478 followers, 1,410 that are, fo that are following. Okay. Uh, let's see. We have, first off, an, a meme. Uh, if this makes you angry, but the, you're okay with this, then it's not about the flag. Okay. Uh, next, quote from Bernie Sanders. What Republicans are saying very loudly and clearly is that no woman in this country has the right to control her own body. I disagree. Okay, next one's another quote from Bernie Sanders. We are going to fight to pass the long overdue equal rights amendment. Okay, uh, with some commentary. Women's rights to control their bodies must be observed and respected. We need a leader who will end this toxic rhetoric that the government has the right to control our bodies. Bernie Sanders is just that one. I have so much respect for him and I truly believe that he'll make women's lives better. Hashtag feminism, hashtag intersectional feminism, hashtag woman's march, hashtag feminist, hashtag feminist aesthetic, Hashtag Bernie Sanders, hashtag feel the burn, hashtag birth control, hashtag abortions, hashtag feminists for Bernie. All right, next uh, video clip from uh, Muffet McGraw, who's the uh, head coach of the Notre, Notre Dame women's basketball team. Uh, Notre Dame coach Muffet McGraw calls for more women in positions of power. We don't have enough female role models. We don't have enough visible women leaders. We don't have enough women in power. Uh, commentary, so lit. Hashtag feminism, hashtag intersectional feminism, hashtag woman's march, hashtag feminist, hashtag feminist aesthetic, hashtag we are feminists. All right, next one. In today's episode of Massive Hypocrisy, uh, with the fetus, every life is pre precious, with the baby, not my problem. Uh, commentary, hypocrisy at its finest, hashtag feminism, hashtag abortion, hashtag Planned Parenthood, hashtag misogyny, hashtag feminist. Uh, next one, another meme. Not a single woman was at the White House meeting on women's health. Okay? With some very extensive commentary here. What's going on with this country? Imagine if dozens of women gathered to make decisions on men's health. Imagine men's reaction to this. However, none of them raised a question whether it is right for men to decide on the issues that have no knowledge and understanding at all. Sick and tired of this. This made me think of how great it would be if we had a government body consisting only of women, and this body could veto any bill it finds discriminatory. Moreover, it could also draft and submit bills concerning women. Just imagine if women could benefit the lives of other women on the governmental level. How cool would this be? Hashtag feminism. Hashtag feminist. Hashtag government. Hashtag White House. Hashtag women's health. Hashtag men's health. Hashtag Planned Parenthood. Hashtag women's rights. All right, now that we've gotten through the sea of hashtags, 
need you to figure out whether this is a troll account or if this is a legit account. Do you think you know? Let's see if you do. This account is a troll. The Instagram account Power to Women is a troll. It was identified by Facebook, which owns Instagram, in October 2019 as part of a network of 50 Instagram accounts they suspended. These accounts were said by Facebook to be originating in Russia and showed links to the Internet Research Agency. Okay? So how can we tell that this Instagram account was a troll? First off, it's an affinity group with no clear organizer. Power to Women presents itself as an affinity group rather than a person. This is likely because Instagram and Facebook users don't typically follow non-famous strangers, but do follow groups they like. Another problematic sign is that no person or organization is listed as running the group. Okay? And here we go to the next. For or against. Power to Women takes advantage of its followers' passion to encourage extreme polarization and suggest that compromise is impossible. Okay? All right, so let's go on to the next profile. All right, now we're going back to Twitter. Okay? This is a twi another Twitter profile. Select an answer at the bottom. All right. Excuse me. All right. So we have an account from Amy G. Okay? Daughter, sister, proud black American. I tend to get political. New York, New York, joined January 2019. Uh, following 13.1 thousand accounts. Uh, following thir has 13,500 followers. Okay. Uh, we have a profile picture of a young black woman. Uh, we have a cover photo, no bad vibes. Okay. Uh, let's see if she can follow her own advice. Let's take a look at her posts. Tweet number one. Republicans better hope the coronavirus isn't spread from kissing ass. Okay, clever. All right. Next. You don't have to say anything to the haters. You don't have to acknowledge them at all. You just wake up every morning and be the best you can be. And that usually tends to shut them up. Michelle Obama. Okay. Next one. On Tuesday, November 3rd, 2020, we, we make America great again by voting this nightmare out of office. Hashtag Trump is a Russian asset. Hashtag Russian interference. Okay. Uh, next one. American injustice. Crystal Mason, black Texas woman, accidentally voted while on probation. Didn't know it was illegal. Uh, five years in prison. Roger Stone, rich white man, knowingly lied to Congress, tampered with witnesses, threatened the federal judge. Only three years in prison. Okay. All right. Uh, 
Is I going to jail? This six-year-old was held at a mental health facility for two days and reportedly sedated without her mother's permission after allegedly having a tantrum at school. This is outrageous. She is six. Uh, and the uh, photo here is actually a uh, supposed to be a clip from Now This, uh, which is actually a legit news, uh, news source. Okay. All right. Republican logic. Birth control? Ban it. Abortion? Ban it. Gay marriage? Ban it. Guns? Look, banning things never works. People will always find ways to get them. Hashtag Seattle shooting. Hashtag enough is enough. All right. So, uh, go over it again. Let's see if you can figure out whether this is a troll or whether it's a legit uh, profile. You got figured out. Let's see what you do. This profile is a troll. Amy is a troll account. Like the previous right-leaning Twitter account, we identified Amy as Russian and worked with Twitter to suspend her account in March 2020. Amy pretends to be a left-leaning black woman, a common tactic among trolls. Amy's strategy is to engage with the black community and other left-leaning users, gain followers among those users, and then use her influence to manipulate users' conversations and push politi particular political agendas. So how can we tell if this is a troll site? Here's the signs. Uh, first, mimicking users who are part of a real and politically focused online community. During the 2016 presidential campaign, dozens of Russian accounts engaged in the Black Lives Matter community pretending to be minorities. This is a tactic referred to as digital blackface, and it has a long history online. Trolls continue to pretend to be members of many different online communities today, everything from Korean pop music fans to LGBTQ activists. Okay. And the next sign. Fanning the flames. Like some right-wing trolls, Amy often frames real events and issues in a way that intensifies anger and division. Many real users may also do this for entirely valid reasons, but some disinformation operations have made anger and disgust into goals unto themselves. Okay. All right, so let's go to the next profile. Let's see what we got. Ah, it's more Twitter. Okay. Let's take a look at this account. This account belongs to Chenjirai Kumanyika. Okay. Scholar, journalist, and activist who works as an assistant professor in Rutgers University's Department of Journalism and Media Studies. He's from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He joined September 2009. Uh, he's following 2,927 accounts and has 19,700 followers. Okay? And he does have a uh, profile photo and he has a front page photo. 
<coughs> just says uncivil. <coughs> All right. Let's take a look at Professor, Professor Kumanyika's account. All right. While the programs that keep us safe, jobs, schools, public defenders are being cut, police get a $14 million budget raise. At a time when police are killing black people, that has to change. Watch the hashtag Philly Police Budget Hearing 6-1 testify to hashtag fund com communities, hashtag defund the police. Okay? Uh, and he's retweeted, uh, uh, he's included a tweet from Movement Alliance Project that includes a flyer for this uh, uh, city council meeting. Okay? Next one. Man forging check to get groceries in a crisis equals criminal. People damaging property to express justified rage plus people taking property to survive equals looters. Corporations that starve economy through tax cuts and $500 billion bailouts equal corporate heroes. Okay. Uh, that's a meme. And just like that, blue lives didn't matter anymore. Okay. Uh, one of the unhinged guys who uh, tried to storm the Michigan uh, Capitol building with their guns in tow. Uh, to protest the fact that they were being forced to, they're they're being they were put, placed under lockdown and uh, had a mask mandate. Okay. Uh, what a relief to see that Joe Biden stands with what? Oh wait, never mind. Uh, and it is a retweet of Bernie Sanders. Uh, on this May Day 20, hashtag May Day 2020, I stand with the workers at Amazon, Whole Foods, Instacart, and Target who are on strike. Essential workers are putting their lives on the line and deserve protection and hazard pay. The endless corporate greed has got to end. All right. Next tweet. I left track recording in Adobe Audition last night around 7 p.m. Just got to my computer right now. It was still recording. Wow. Uh, next one is a retweet from Mark Lamont Hill. Brilliant piece exam explaining why COVID-19 is disproportionately affecting black women. And that links to an article. Okay. So, uh, up to you to decide now. Uh, is this a troll account or is this a legit account? All right, folks, do you think you know the answer? Are you sure? Let's see if you do. This account is legit. Professor Kumanyika is a real person. As his profile indicates, he is a scholar, journalist, and activist at Rutgers University. Okay? So let's see. How can we tell that this was a legit account? First, he has identifiable information. While many real users prefer to remain anonymous on social media for a variety of valid reasons, all troll accounts are anonymous. 
Professional trolls avoid using identifying information that is easy to debunk, as Professor Kumanika does in his profile. Okay? Because he was very specific about who he is in his profile. Uh, also, he has a local focus, just like uh, Christopher did earlier. Trolls tend to cast a wide national or global net with the focus of their content, rather than locally oriented items like the post below. Uh, again, that was the one about the post about the Philadelphia uh, police budget hearing. Okay. All right. So let's take a look at the seventh profile. Here's the seventh profile. Uh, from it's an Instagram profile this time. All right. Uh, the account is called Nevada Blue Line. Nevada Peace Officers, Thin Blue Line, and Blue Lives Matters. Let's support our heroes in blue together. Hashtag back the blue. Uh, has 585 posts, has 4,122 followers, and it's following 5,815 accounts. All right, let's take a look at what we got. Aw, that's cute. No matter the patch, we are all family, and family sticks together. Okay? Nice sentiment. All right, next one. Police are the most mistreated people in America, but that's about to change. Let's do it together. Okay, there's some, there, there's a several arguments that can be made about that, but we're not going to get into that right now. All right, next one. Thank you, you who all the moms working patrol today. You have a warrior's heart and a mother's love. Thank you for serving and protecting. Yeah, interesting, this is posted in July 21st where it seems like it should be for Mother's Day. Okay. Next. Law enforcement, we face what you fear. Police are needed to keep us safe from the criminals among us and the horrors of the world around us. Without them, we would be vulnerable and helpless. They are needed for without them, we are alone. Without police, everything would change. I support the men and women in blue now and forever. Blue lives matter. Okay. Next one. A society that wants to make war with police better learn to make friends with its criminals. Evil is powerless if the good are unafraid. Okay. Next one. I don't always bite the bad guy. Just kidding. Yes, I do. Do you know that police dogs can, can and do bite with up to about 240 pounds of force or more? They are trained to contain potential threats, bite and hold, but they should release if the perpetrator stops resisting and fighting back. Hashtag thick blue line. Hashtag blue lives matter. Hashtag hold the line. Hashtag back the blue. Hashtag swole patrol. Hashtag fit for duty. Hashtag we fight what you fear. Hashtag we own the night. Hashtag relentless defend. Defender. Hashtag law enforcement. Hashtag thin blue line. Hashtag act of kindness. Hashtag above and beyond. Hashtag oath of honor. Hashtag officer safety. Hashtag lead by example. Hashtag sheepdog. Hashtag stay vigilant. Hashtag always strapped. Hashtag a hero remembered and never dies. Hashtag Nevada police. Hashtag Nevada. Hashtag police. Hashtag police of Nevada. Hashtag U.S. police. It's a lot of hashtags there. Okay, next one. Okay, some uh, semi cheesecake. Hashtag police. Hashtag Nevada police. Hashtag Nevada K9. Hashtag K9. All right, so again, let's see if you know if this is a troll account or legitimate account.
Okay, do you think you got it figured out? Let's see if you're right. Uh, Nevada blue Nevada blue line is a troll account. The Instagram account Nevada Blue Line is a troll. It was also identified by Facebook as part of the October 2019 network of troll accounts originating in Russia. As you've seen with previous troll accounts in this quiz, disinformation attacks multiple perspectives in many cultural conflicts. This account further illustrates that. So, what are some signs that we could tell that the uh, Nevada Blue Line was a troll? First off, it's a divisive affinity group. Like power to women, this group pushes a very for us or against us worldview. Okay? In this case, it's very pro police. Okay? And then the next one swing state affiliation. Maybe you didn't quite think about that one. Nevada is a swing state. Trolls often associate themselves with the swing state to attract followers. However, closer examination often reveals no content focused on the state they claim to be from, Nevada and no information about the organizer who runs the account. Okay, I don't know if you noticed that. Uh, in the actual posts themselves, uh, other than hashtags that were added on, that were tacked on to the last two posts, there was no mention of anything remotely related to Nevada. It was all police, okay? All right, let's take a look at the eighth profile. All right, this is, a, this is another Facebook profile, okay? We're going to have you look at it, and then we'll figure out what you think it is. All right, this uh, profile is for Mike Adams. Mike Adams, known as the Health Ranger, is an outspoken consumer health advocate. Lives in Austin, Texas, from Tucson, Arizona. Uh, 54,653 followers. Uh, he does have a profile picture. He does have a cover picture, okay? Nice batch of cherries there. All right. So, Mike's posts. First off, major U.S. brands demand EPA take action to stop pre-harvest spraying of toxic glyphosate on food crops. Okay. That links to a uh, blog posting, it looks like, from science.news. Okay. <clears throat> Next one. Five vegetable sprouts good for your health. Okay. Goes to natural.newsblogs.com. Okay. Next one. The geoengineering chemical of the future that has been dispersed by jet aircraft for decades. Hashtag chemtrails. Okay. So another natural news blog article. Okay. Next one. Pesticides, GMO, BPA, hormones. Content isn't available right now. It's been removed. Next one. Think about it. Content is available right now. Next post. Content is available right now. Next post, wheatgrass literally has the ability to turn gray hair back to its natural color. I don't care if it can, I am never eating that stuff, okay? But that goes to another natural news blogs uh, page, okay? All right, so this is our last opportunity here. Is this account a troll account or is it legit?
All right, this is the last shot. Are you ready? Here we go. Uh, Mike Adams is legit. All right. Mike Adams, the health ranger, is a real person. He is the founder and owner of the website Natural News. His personal Facebook page is a tool to push users to his website where they will find sensational news stories sometimes with little truth to them. So he's not exactly ethical and not exactly uh, on the up and up, but he is an actual person. He is not a a, uh, 40-something overweight Russian uh, in a shed with a computer. Okay? Let's see what the signs are. Uh, Misinformation for profit. Mike Adams uses social media to promote the tabloid-like stories from the websites where he sells his products. Okay, and He has a network of websites that he uses to basically push a lot of uh, uh, health food items. Okay, Content not available. Multiple removed posts are a huge red flag in determining trustworthiness, but they don't always prove that the account itself is fake. Okay. Again, uh, Facebook actually ha- has an algorithm that determines if something is considered to be too untruthful, it will remove it, okay? Uh, or at least it will provide a fact-checking link along with the link that you post, okay? If it's something that is known to be uh, false, okay? Uh, lately, they've also added a tag that uh, warns about misinformation. They also have a... Uh, uh, cover that they put over uh, graphics that may contain misinformation as well. All right, so let's take a look at the sc- full score. Hopefully, everybody got eight out of eight on this. Okay, if you did, congratulations, you are an expert troll killer. Okay, uh, let's get back to the PowerPoint. All right, we got one more little thing we have to talk about here, and that is. Uh, at least on this topic, and that is evaluating web sources, okay? Web sources can be wonderful in that they are convenient to find and easy to use, but they can also be a minefield of opinionated articles and urban myths. So you have to be careful about checking your web sources, making sure that they are legitimate. We actually just saw this this week uh, where uh, the president actually cited an article uh, about his opponent, okay, that was published by Babylon B. Uh, apparently somebody forgot to tell the president that Babylon B is a satire site. Okay. So nothing there is supposed to be taken seriously. All right. Evaluate web sources similarly to how print sources are judged. Use critical reading and research into sites to help evaluate. Okay. So here's some things to look for. Authority. Who is the page sponsor? Are the author credentials identified? Is the sponsor's motivation clearly stated from the home page? Is there contact information? Okay. Can you follow up and find out who is actually uh, benefiting from the uh, dissemination of this information? Okay. Uh, objectivity. Is there a clear purpose to the site? Do they have a stated agenda? Okay. Does it have an explicit point of view? Are author affiliations listed? Do you know who the author uh, identifies with? Is the audience identified? Do we know who it is that's aimed for? Uh, coverage. What topics are included on the site? Uh, what other things do they really talk about? Is there a suitable depth of coverage or are they just skimming the surface on everything? Uh, is there evidence presented or is it just a lot of people presenting conjecture? Okay. Uh, so accuracy. Are sources cited? Okay. Do you have citations that you can follow up with? Do facts appear accurate? Uh, does, does it follow with what you know of the topic or what you've heard about the topic or any common information you may have about the topic? Is it independently verifiable? Can you fact check it? Okay. Uh, the last one here is not is one you usually deal with only with websites, and that's currency. Okay. When was the last site update? How long has it been since somebody has touched this site? Uh, when was the article uploaded? Has it been updated since? to reflect main new information, okay? Is the information current or relevant at the present? One thing you have to be careful about websites is that they tend to be permanent. So maybe something that you have uh, posted about years ago no longer is valid, okay? But you still have the page up there so people are gonna think, hey, you know what you're talking about. Now you have to make sure that you're updating, okay? Or at least to have put out a, 
or at least that you've put out some kind of uh, notification of when it was posted, when it was last accurate. Another quick way you can evaluate web sources is through domain identifiers. Okay, uh, these common identifiers are usually uh, a good method of determining what a good site is for research. Okay, so let's talk, look through all these. One of them is .com. Okay, .coms are typically commercial sites. Most times they promote businesses or marketing services and typically have no identified authors, okay? Most times dot-coms are only useful if you are doing research on the specific company that the dot-com belongs to. However, there's one exception to this and that is most major newspapers have dot-com sites, okay? So if you're working with a major newspaper site and it's a dot-com, that's still legit, okay? We have .org, which is a nonprofit organization or advocacy group. They, some of them are neutral, but most of them, they have a distinct angle of vision. Uh, they are usually reliable as long as most times it's be, if you're writing about that particular group. Now, also keep in mind that some .orgs are less than reputable, okay? Uh, for instance, if you ever are unfortunate enough to stumble across the website for the Westboro Baptist Church, uh, their website is a .org web website. Uh, the URL of which I refuse to say because it's patently offensive. Uh, then we have the .edu sites. Those are college and university sites. They typically include institutional information as well as scholarly and advocacy links. Okay, Most times stuff at edus are reliable, Okay, especially if they're produced by professors. Uh, next one, go .gov and .mil are government agencies and military units. Uh, they usually contain a wide range of data and support for policy. Generally speaking, .gov and .mil is considered to be reliable. Uh, evaluate your own purpose for using the web source as well to help the evaluation process of your sources. So think carefully, long and hard. Does your purpose call for a more objective view or for an advocate? Because if you need a more objective view, you may want to avoid some web sources. You may want to avoid certain web sources because they will have a point of view. They will usually have some advocacy side. Okay? So, these are all things to take into consideration as you're doing your research for the annotated dib. Now, we're going to take a brief intermission here, maybe about a couple minutes. Uh, and when we come back here, we're going to start talking about the final exam. Uh, that time's coming up, folks. So, let's. Take a few, take a brief, brief break here, and then we will get into the final exam.
All right, we're back. So uh, we're going to talk briefly uh, at the end of the, for the end of the session here today about the final exam materials. Okay, you may have noticed last week that this that the materials went live on eCampus. You there was a, a link that appeared for final exam. Uh, it now has one document in it. Okay, let me talk this over for you real quick before you get too confused. The final exam for this class is going to be a timed writing assignment. Okay. You will need to secure a proctor to administer the exam for you. They're going to act as a timekeeper. Okay? The exam itself is going to be uh, done on eCampus, but you will need somebody to make sure that you follow the rules of the exam and that you remain within the time limit. Just so you know, the time limit for this exam is one hour and 50 minutes, which is the approximate amount of time the exam period would last. Okay? So. Uh, you're going to, it's going to be up to you to locate a proctor. Uh, this could be someone within your household who can just watch you and make sure that you don't cheat. Okay. An exam packet is currently available on eCampus. It will give you most of the necessary materials for the exam, as well as a list of four possible questions that may appear. Okay. Uh, these, the, the, I can guarantee you that the, that two out of the four questions will appear. Okay. The thing is, I'm not going to tell you which two because I don't even know yet. The reason why I give you the questions, though, is that you can practice writing your response within the time limit. Okay? That's going to be important here. You want to be able to fully think through your essay and be able to produce something that is readable, that is logical, uh, and, produce, and provides a decent argument within that time limit. It also has to be fully workshopped at the same during that time. So you need to do some revisions and you need to polish it. Okay. As far as the type of writing you're going to be doing, we'll talk about that in a second. It is highly suggested that, again, that you perform some further research into the materials presented, especially if some of it is unfamiliar to you. Okay. It is also highly suggested that you print out the packet. Now, I do apologize because the packet is kind of long. It's close to 40 pages long. Okay. But you are allowed to use the packet in the exam along with any additional material that you write into it. So any notes that you take on the materials or any extra notes that you take from further research has to go into the packet in order for you to be able to use it. Your notes are acceptable for use. This exam is not about memorization and regurgitation of facts. This exam is about how well you can reason under pressure. Okay. The type of writing you're going to be doing is commonly what's known as strong response writing, uh, where you're going to write in response to something you read and a, and a given prompt. Okay, uh, And the prompts I'm giving you are all designed for persuasion. So you should be using your skills with logic, rhetoric, and argument uh, when you are crafting your responses. Okay, But the important thing is the packet is legal to use during the period, during the exam period. Okay. With that, with no further ado, then we're going to take a look at what the exam topic is. Here we go. The final exam topic for your for your exam is children's television censorship. Okay. Always under intense scrutiny, children's television can sometimes veer into areas where general, that is, say, adult audiences become more uncomfortable with subject matter. Reactions to these ventures into the wilderness can vary on a local or national scale, but many times when the ire of the adults thinking of the children is raised, it leads to the censorship or wholesale change to individual episodes or even entire series. Okay. Now, uh, this is a complex issue that has really been pertinent ever since the dawn of television. We're focusing mainly on more recent stuff. We're talking no earlier than the 90s. Okay. Well, there's one that goes into the 80s, but most of it's going to be the 90s and later. Okay. Now, there is no usual suspects when it comes to what causes controversy or what shows it appears on. The only commonality is that something angers a potentially powerful membership of the audience and leads to banning of episodes, cutting of scenes, or in some cases, changing characters. Okay. Uh, got two examples on this page. Uh, we're going to talk briefly about one of them later. Uh, that is the uh, sprawled woman on the kitchen floor there. That's going to be important. Uh, but the other one I want to show you here, you may notice there's a scene here from Steven Universe. It's uh, Ruby and Sapphire. Okay. 
uh, funny story about them that relates into this uh, changing characters, okay? Uh, as you're probably aware, there's a lot of uh, lesbian overtones to the relationships in Steven Universe, uh, mainly because all the, ge all the gems are coded as female. Uh, as a result, uh, it, uh, the show made history by uh, portraying the first ever lesbian wedding in children's television on, uh, in America. Okay, uh, it, uh, And it was between these two characters, Ruby and Sapphire. Here's the funny part. It, what, it's been known from the beginning that these two were considered to be, were considered to be lovers. Uh, when the show was taken to Russia, okay, Russia has extremely stringent laws about what they call homosexual propaganda. Okay, uh, basically it's outlawed. Okay, so in order to make Steven Universe comply with that ruling, uh, they changed the voice of Ruby to a man. Okay, the she she typically has an extremely high pitched voice in English, uh, but they made uh, they coded Ruby as a man with her with by changing her voice to a man's voice in Russia. Uh, I have a feeling that the creators of the show got wind of this. And I'm pretty sure they did, uh, because they totally trolled the Russians uh, when it came to the actual wedding, because Ruby was the one who wore the gown. And Sapphire wore the tuxedo, even though their typical wardrobe is coded the other way around. Okay, so that's kind of their haha -ha moment at the expense of the Russian government. Not to mention the fact that if you look at a world maps in that show, uh, Russia is basically a giant crater. Okay, so uh, having some fun there. Anyway. Issues causing controversy change over time, ranging from issues with violent content and overtly offensive behavior to uncomfortable social movements, it's a civil rights movement, the LGBTQIA plus community, etc., and uncomfortable social societal ills, such as mass incarceration, opio the opioid crisis, and so on and so forth. Uh, you might be wondering why there's a scene from Sesame Street here. Well, it's uh, talking about those uncomfortable societal ills. The green Muppet there, the green monster Muppet, her name is Carly. Uh, she was just introduced last year. Uh, Carly is a character who is currently in foster care. Uh, and in the episode they introduced her, they found out the reason why she's in foster care is because her parents are in rehab for opioid addiction. Okay? So this is how they're trying to explain uh, what happens with opioid addiction to kids. Okay? All right, so uh, we're gonna go through the packet in the order that I have them in. Uh, they have the uh, sections in. So the first thing that you have in there is an article from Looper, uh, dealing with 11 uh, children's television shows so uh, so controversial they were banned. Okay. The list tends to cover most of the reasons behind children's TV causing controversy in general. Okay. So these are the reasons why they had these particular shows banned. Uh, Number one is violence. Uh, the episode in question is Deadly Force, an episode of, Gar of Disney's Gargoyles. We're going to talk about that in a minute here. Okay, good to go in more detail. Uh, we have offensive content and language. Okay, uh, two ep the two shows cited for that, uh, one of them is Dexter's Laboratories episode Rude Removal. Uh, if you're not familiar with this, it was a body episode of the show where... Uh, the two main characters, uh, Dexter and Dee Dee, uh, were put through a machine that was supposed to remove uh, the, their uh, rude behavior, but what it did was actually clone them and split their personalities into two entirely into two different people for each one. Uh, there was a good Dexter and Dee Dee who were vaguely British and extremely polite, and then you had bad Dexter and Dee Dee who were extremely rude, and every third word they said was bleeped. So it was basically the implication that they were, were they were cussing like sailors that got it banned. Okay. Uh, the other one, Cow and Chicken, uh, Buffalo Gals. The article puts it best. This episode is nothing but seven minutes of seven minutes of rude lesbian jokes. Uh, the Buffalo Gals are a uh, butch, all female biker gang who break into people's homes and start munching their carpets. Okay. Uh, 
third one, physical harm to viewers. The episode for this is uh, Electric Soldier Porygon from the original Pokemon series. This was the infamous episode that caused several several hundred children in Japan to go to the hospital with seizures because of an alternating red and blue strobe pattern that showed up uh, for about a minute halfway through the show. Okay. Uh, Next one is excessive death portrayals. Uh, One the one episode is one beer, but from Tiny Toon Adventures, which was intended to be a kids' PSA about the dangers of drinking, but it turned into uh, the three characters you see there: Buster, Buster Bunny, a Plucky Duck, and Hampton J Pig, uh, finding a beer in, a refri- in the refrigerator and going on a day-long bender, which ends in them hijacking a police car, driving it off a cliff, and dying. Okay. Uh, the other one, Sailor Moon Day of Destiny. This was a two-part episode that in the U.S. was condensed into a single episode. Uh, the hard part about this was the first part of it was a cliffhanger where almost all the Sailor Scouts died. Uh, so in order to assuage uh, censors, when they localized it and converted this to a single two episodes to a single episode, they removed anything that could have been construed as death. And in the American version, the Sailor Scouts were simply incapacitated. Uh, offensive religious content. Uh, the only entire series that's on this list is the Garbage Pail Kids, which was pulled before it even saw air because of objections from several religious groups that it was sacrilegious. Uh, then there's also an episode of the Powerpuff Girls, See Me, Feel Me, Know Me, uh, which was for pulled for an entirely ridiculous religious reason. It was because at some point in the episode, buildings are blown up, and according to the show's creator, it was banned because the... Uh, wreckage of the buildings made uh, had a number of iron uh, beams that looked like crucifixes. Okay. Uh, next one is overt sexual content. Uh, what, one of these is Batman the Brave and the Bold, The Mask of Matches Malone. Uh, it got banned over a uh, performance by three female heroes commonly called the Bird of Birds of Prey uh, who are trying to do to sneak into a nightclub uh, owned by a villain. Uh, so they wind up doing a cabaret show uh, where they're singing about the prowess of the Justice League in the bedroom, uh, specifically the male members of the Justice League. Uh, as it happens, one of the people in the audience is a fellow named Matches Malone. Uh, if you know anything about animated Batman, you'll know that Matches Malone is Batman's alias when he goes undercover. Okay. Uh, the thing that really got it uh, in trouble was the scene that's actually portrayed here. Uh, That is Huntress. At that point, she is singing about Aquaman's little fish. And that's why her her finger is up because she's waggling it. Okay? Uh, Very suggestively, by the way. Uh, The other one uh, here, Outlaw Star, Hot Springs Planet Tenray. It's an anime Hot Springs episode. I don't think I have to say very much more. Uh, the last one, promoting antisocial behavior. This is the oldest episode on that list. It's an episode of Dudley Duray called Stokey the Bear. Uh, This was pulled at the request of the U.S. Park Service uh, because they did not like uh, Stokey being a parody of Smokey the Bear uh, because Stokey was running around starting fires instead of putting them out. Uh, Because he's uh, in the episode, for the purpose of the episode, he's under hypnosis by the villain uh, Snidely Whiplash who wants to have a weenie roast. And so he convinces, uh, hypnotizes Stokey into setting the forest on fire so he has plenty of fire to to roast his weenies. Okay. Uh, the other thing that got this one in trouble was near the end of the episode, it's actually implied that Stokey is responsible for the 1871 Chicago fire. Okay. So uh, that one got pulled from TV, was never rebroadcast. All right. So there's three case studies in the packet. Uh, what two, one is a single episode, one is an entire series, and one is an issue that gets called on a lot. Okay, so let's start first with a single episode, and that is the episode Deadly Force uh, from uh, Disney's Gargoyles. This was the eighth episode of the first season, and considering that the pilot of this series was five episodes long, that means that in only in the third regular episode of the series they got into this issue, okay? Now, the plot line, uh, well, if you're not familiar with the show, the show is basically a group of uh, gargoyles who 
uh, were living in uh, medieval Scotland uh, are tr transplanted and reawakened in 1990s New York City. Okay, uh, and they take up their original uh, roles of being guardians. In this case, they're guarding the entire city as opposed to just their castle. Okay, one of the things that they have is they have a human ally uh, who is a, a police detective by the name of Elisa Maza. Okay, uh, the other thing I should explain is that other than the lead gargoyle whose name was Goliath, the rest of the clan did not have names until they came to New York, and they named themselves after landmarks in New York City. The eldest, uh, the elder statesman Gargoyle named himself Hudson after the Hudson River. Uh, they have a dog named Bronx, okay? And then you have three younger Gargoyles as part of the clan. Uh, that would be Brooklyn, Broadway, and Lexington. They named themselves after streets in Manhattan, okay? Uh, Broadway is like a very chubby, very jovial kind of uh, fella, okay? Uh, very lighthearted, kind of immature, okay? Uh, in this in this episode he gets enamored with a western movie called showdown uh and he likes the action he also likes the gun play okay uh after seeing it for like the third or fourth time uh he makes his way over to elisa's apartment where she's just come home uh and while she's while she's uh cooking dinner for herself and she's offered broadway some too while she's while she's cooking broadway finds her service pistol it's a 45 automatic uh, and starts uh, pointing it around her apartment, and unfortunately, it accidentally goes off. Uh, when it does, he accidentally shoots Elisa. Okay, so a lot of the episode involves his guilt over it, and how he takes out that guilt on some gun runners that Elisa had been pursuing uh, before she was shot. Okay, uh, so basically, he was playing cowboy, and he accidentally shot Elisa with her own gun. Okay. Now, this episode originally aired in syndication. Uh, Gargoyles was part of the Disney Afternoon package. It was a syndicated show. Okay. However, when it started appearing in other Disney networks, such as Dis Toon Disney and Disney XD, uh, Deadly Force was removed entirely. Okay. The episode did not air initially. Okay. Other networks that showed the series digitally removed blood from the scene where Lisa was shot. That's the scene that we have here. Uh, this is the aftermath of her getting shot. She's sprawled on the on her kitchen floor, and you see she has blood pooling under her. Okay, uh, rebroadcast specifically on the USA Network. Uh, Photoshop the blood out. Okay, so that you wouldn't see the blood. Okay. Now the episode was restored fully intact in 2013 for a DVD, the DVD collection of the first season. Okay. However, in 2019. Uh, it, Gargoyles was one of the first offerings that was placed onto Disney Plus. However, and I actually confirmed this as I was creating this packet, uh, the scene in Deadly Force where Elisa was sh is shot has been altered so that this entire this entire sequence here uh, that you see here with her on her kitchen floor, it's entirely gone. Okay, you don't ever see her like this. All you ever see is her her arm from around a wall, uh, around the corner of a wall, and then you see her face showing her pain, showing her anguish that she's just been shot, and that's it. Uh, there is still some there's still some blood because uh, Broadway takes her to the hospital, uh, lays her down on an emergency room gurney. When he comes away from laying her down, he's got blood on his hands. Okay, uh, but. The actual, the actual shot where she's bleeding out on the floor is now gone. Okay. Uh, this was in response to the anti-violence crowd who said that this was too violent for children. However, this was import, an important episode because it was an anti, a gun control episode of trying to teach kids that guns are not playthings. Uh, next case study is Sesame Street. Okay. Uh, might be surprised that it's here, but it's generated its own share of controversy. This is the gold standard of American children's television here. Sesame Street is currently in its 50th season and is now shared, shared between two networks. Uh, it still airs on PBS. However, new episodes debut first on HBO before making their way to PBS now. Okay. Sesame Street has earned no shortage of criticism over how issues have been portrayed on the show. The loudest and most harsh criticism has involved portrayals of social issues such as multiculturalism and societal ills. Okay? 
people have been upset about how they've handled these things. Certain certain things they've handled, they've been able to get uh, praise for, and they've said they've handled them well. Like when they, the, the occasions when they've dealt with death. Okay, uh, there, there's a very famous episode of uh, Sesame Street that aired shortly after Thanksgiving, where the uh, uh, show dealt with the death of one of the actors uh, who played Mr. Hooper, the, the shopkeeper. Uh, and they filtered the episode through Big Bird's perspective, trying to teach him about death. Okay. Uh, the other one that they received a lot of praise for was their first episode post 9-11. Okay. However, there are some, some crowds that do not like the way they portray other things. One of the big ones in early in its run was multiculturalism, especially from Southern broadcasters. In fact, there was a legislator in Mississippi who, after a campus shooting, uh, demanded that the show be banned from broadcast in the state of Mississippi uh, because he did not like the fact that it was encouraging uh, integration. Okay? The show has introduced characters over the years who introduced children to these societal concepts usually in response to criticisms and have integrated them into the show's overall storyline. So some examples of these characters that are presented, one of them is this character here. His name is Roosevelt Franklin. Uh, he is one of the multicultural characters. He's uh, coded to be black. Uh, he was created by one of the uh, live actors who is also African-American. Uh, and he's also intended to be a non-typical, non-stereotype uh, african-american character he does speak kind of with an altered ave uh dialogue uh, however he's also a, a, he's also coded to be a genius and part of his role in this in the show is that he runs an elementary school okay even though he's a kid himself all right so roosevelt franklin is one of those characters uh, you might be surprised that Abby Cadabby is one of these characters. If you know, if you've seen Sesame Street since at least the mid '90s, you know Abby Cadabby. Okay, uh, she's the uh, fairy character. As it turns out, they could use her for society for difficult topics for kids because her parents are divorced. Okay, so that's, so she's used to teach kids about uh, dealing with divorce. Uh, then you have the character of Julia, uh, who is an autistic, uh, who's on the autism spectrum. Uh, Julia actually caused controversy herself because the autism uh, charity that helped the uh, Sesame Workshop uh, create her uh, to be as realistic as possible uh, eventually wind up severing ties over some dispute over Julia's characterization. Okay, so Julia uh, has her own set of controversies, but mainly she's just there to try to help to teach kids how to deal with uh, classmates who may be on the autism spectrum. Okay. Uh, then you have Alex. Uh, Alex is a uh, Muppet who has an incarcerated father. So they used him as a uh, way to teach kids about what to do when you have family in jail. Okay. Then you have Lily. Lily started off as a, uh, a lesson in, about uh, hunger and poverty. Okay. And she still kind of is. Uh, initially, it was just that she was hungry because her... her uh, uh, family was on welfare and couldn't afford a lot of, uh, sometimes couldn't afford to put food on the table. Okay. Later on, they actually got evicted. So then she became about homelessness. Okay. Still an aspect of poverty. Uh, mentioned Carly earlier about foster care and parental opioid addiction. One other one I want to mention, uh, and this was also significant, uh, Sesame Street is a show that's localized for, uh, uh, different countries they actually the countries entirely produce their own versions okay with their own Muppets and their own characters and their own human characters in their own languages okay one one Muppet in one of those foreign versions did cause controversy and that was Kami she was a, she was a Muppet that appeared in the South African version of Sesame Street Kami is HIV positive okay in a continent where you still have countries that want to try to sweep HIV under the rug, still consider it to be gay cancer, uh, where you have certain companies where countries where homosexuality is punishable by death. Okay. They put up, they put out Kami and she instantly caused outrage because, uh, supposedly she was promoting, uh, immoral behavior. 
because the stigma is that the only way you get HIV is either through sex or drug use. Okay? So how could this Muppet have it? Okay? So she's kind of there to try to break some of the stigmas about HIV because there's a lot, there's a huge amount of people on the African continent who have HIV. Uh, controversial topic case study. This is LGBTQIA plus representation. Okay. In more recent years, this has become the hot button topic. Okay. The issue that's led to more children's TV to be altered than any other has tended to be issues around this, specifically portrayals of relationships and characters in media. Okay. Uh, much of the censorship surrounding this issue winds up getting enacted in foreign countries when shows are localized. Uh, I gave you that example earlier of uh, Ruby being coded male by Russia because they were uncomfortable with her being female. Okay. Uh, another example of Steven Universe being censored was a few uh, characters tend to do dances if they want to fuse into new characters in that show. Uh, typically, it's with, between gems who, again, are coded as female. Uh, so a fusion dance between Rose Quartz and Pearl in an episode uh, was cut significantly by UK censors uh, to avoid anything that looked like a romantic clinch between the two. Okay. Uh, now, this also has precedent in the US, uh, specifically the localization of Sailor Moon. Uh, the thing is with the original Sailor Moon, or with Sailor Moon in general, you have two characters, Sailor Uranus and Sailor Saturn. Or no, not Sailor. I, why do I call? It? I keep seeing the wrong Sailor. It's Sailor Neptune. It's Sailor Uranus and Sailor Neptune. Okay. Uh, in the original source material, they are lesbian lovers. Okay, and that was carried over into the TV show as well in Japan. In the U.S., they said, "Oh no, 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 no! We can't do this lesbian stuff." Okay, we need to change them to something else, something that will explain why they're so close to each other. Let me think here. Let's make them cousins. Okay. Now we opened up an entirely new can of worms because now they didn't alter any of the scenes involving those two. They just changed the references to their relationship. And as a result, what was just a normal lesbian relationship now suddenly turns into incest. Okay. All right. <laughs> Had some fun there. All right. Shows have been developed in recent years that have had LGBTQIA plus representation built into them, sometimes as a framework the entire show is built around, okay? Examples of this would be Steven Universe, okay? Many of the relationships in the show are built to be examples of healthy lesbian relationships. They also have other, uh, other letters in that uh, acronym represented. Uh, the character Stevani, who is a fusion character between uh, title character Steven Universe and his uh, human best friend Connie Maheshwaran. Uh, obviously, we have a male female, we have an intergender character who uses they them pronouns. Okay. Also, uh, one of the characters, uh, one of the gem characters, Paradot, is coded to be a asexual, okay, which is the A part of that acronym. Okay. Another good example of this is She-Ra and the Princesses of Power, which just recently wrapped up its run on Netflix. Okay, uh, Specifically, this one centers on the, the two characters that are shown in this screenshot. That would be Adora and Catra. Uh, the entire center of, their, of the storyline of that show is the relationship between those two. And in fact, when you get to the ending of it, the uh, affirmation of the love they share winds up being the, the catalyst that actually saves the universe, okay? While many shows can only get away with it in closing seasons or episodes, more shows recently are being overt about their representation with the support of their broadcast platforms. It used to be that the broadcasters were very squeamish about this sort of thing, okay? You could only do it if it was in the very last episode. Some of the very famous shows that did this in the very last episode, Legend of Korra with Korra and Asami, okay? Uh, Adventure Time, Princess Bubblegum and Marceline, okay? Uh, Gravity Falls did this with the two uh, sheriff's deputies. Uh, uh, I had his name. Uh, the, the sheriff and his deputy, okay? Uh, and But now more and more you're seeing it showing up earlier and more often and being more integral, 
Okay, the most recent example of this in the fir- in its first season, uh, a Disney show called the if you're familiar with this called the Owl House, uh, now has a uh, same-sex couple. Okay, uh, it's actually the lead, but the lead character is half of that couple. Okay. All right, so they're getting more support for this now. That's not to say that it's uh, changing the audience because you still have some audience members who, dis- who dispute this and some audience members who protest it. Now, the packet has some extra resources as well, okay? Uh, mainly going to be film clips, but we also have a five-part uh, article from a uh, magazine called Impact, which is the, which is put out, or not magazine, it's the student newspaper uh, of the University of Nottingham in England. Okay, uh, it's a five-part article about LGBTQIA plus representation. Uh, it's covered one platform per article. Basically, how it works is it's going to look at a single platform for each article. So the first one, first article covers Cartoon Network. Second article is Nickelodeon. Third article is uh, positive net or negative Netflix. Uh, fourth article is positive Netflix, and the fifth the fifth one is Disney. Okay. There's also twelve video clips which give samples from the following shows that are affected by these issues. Many of these are what caused the censorship issues in the first place. The clips themselves are those. Okay. Some of them have more clips than others. I know that there are three Sesame Street clips. Okay. So the shows that are covered in the, fi- the film, the uh, video clips, uh, Gargoyles, Dexter's Lab, Tiny Toon Adventures, Cow and Chicken, Dudley Do-Right, Batman the Brave and the Bold, Garbage Pail Kids, Sailor Moon, Pokemon, Powerpuff Girls, Outlaw Star, Three Clips of Sesame Street, Kipo in the Age of Wonder Beasts, which has an openly gay male character, uh, Steven Universe clip you have is The Wedding of Ruby and Sapphire, she and the Princesses of Power, the clip that you have is an overview of the history of the entire relationship between Adora and Catra. Uh, Gravity Falls, uh, that's the sheriff and his deputy. Uh, Legend of Korra, it's the closing scene of the uh, series when uh, Korra and Asami confirm their relationship. Uh, Adventure Time is the history of the la- relationship between Princess Bubblegum and Marceline. And then the last one is the clip from the Owl House. This is the uh, uh, the confirmation of this relationship uh, between these two characters, Luce and, A- Luce and Amity. Okay? Uh, that's actually what, that scene is actually what triggered me to think about this uh, topic in the first place. Okay? All right, so I'm uh, sorry for this double length episode here, but uh, that will do it for this week. Uh, just as a reminder, you should be working on the anti bibliographies. Uh, you should be working in your teams on these. Uh, make sure that you integrate some of the stuff we've been talking about here in regards to our, uh, in regards to checking your sources, uh, double checking their reliability. Okay. Uh, make sure that you are keeping up with MindTap and the discussion boards. Uh, you probably gonna be a good idea to print out the final exam uh, packet and start working with those questions. And with all that said and done, uh, I will have another collaborate session. Hope this week we will do it on the regular day instead of having to do it on Friday. I apologize again for that. Uh, with all that said and done, I will see you guys next week. Thank you for watching.